Petra, thank you very much for showing us around uh, in St. John's College Library. I understand that we have quite a bit of a Willis legacy uh, in our uh, library. What do we have? Yeah, that's right. Um, we have one copy at least of all seven books that Willis has published during his lifetime. Um, we do not have a copy of the one posthumously published English uh, work, um, but we do have an uh, 1682 Opera Omnia published in Amsterdam. Um, of these printed books, um, most of them are also in other um, college libraries in Oxford, in the Bodleian, uh, worldwide. Um, well, you wouldn't call them rare books, um, with one exception, and that is um, a, an edition of Distribe Due Medico Philosophiche with uh, rather a different title page. The book doesn't provide uh, the title with which we're all familiar, but um, it is nevertheless believed to be a reissue of the more readily available uh, Diatribe Due Medico Philosophiche, uh, probably even published in the same year, 1659, uh, published by the same publisher with the same imprint, in fact, and also the same year. Um, but um, from what we know, this is the only copy that has survived. We also do have a collection of several letters by um, Thomas Woolwich, which is, as I understand it, is a, a rather unique as well. The letters are all part of an album, a collection of 17th century letters written to one uh, Dr. Richard Higgs, who is based in Coventry. So right now we are looking at the original handwriting of, of Thomas Willis in a letter he wrote to Dr. Higgs. The letters we have from uh, Thomas Willis uh, they all refer to his uh, practice. Um, they don't refer to his research, uh, only mention uh, one of his publications indirectly once. Um, it is uh, full of uh, recommendations for patients' treatments, um, uh, recipes for uh, uh, prescriptions, um, the recipes usually in Latin. Um, and uh, it is nice to see that Thomas Will Willis uh, really seems to care about his patients. If he hasn't heard from them for a while, but treatment is still ongoing, uh, he asks how they are doing, um, if, any, if uh, Richard Hicks has heard anything and can let him know if everything is uh, going in the right direction. Um, and uh, what is also nice to see, especially from a patient's uh, point of view is, that Thomas Willis doesn't just focus on his own courses of treatment. He's uh, very willing to um, um, accept, uh, to even um, recommend treatments of other physicians of the time. And it, it one gets the impression that it's a very collaborative, very open um, uh, correspondence and, and treatment for the patients. And also, when I was talking to Alastair Compton, who is, who is the expert, he said that hardly any original handwriting survived Willis. So the kind of letters we have from him, uh, they are extremely valuable. All of the other letters, they, at least from a lay point of view, sort of seem to be everyday medical problems, nothing that particularly touches the subject of uh, neurology for which Willis is so famous. But this letter um, from the 24th of March, 1665, discusses the case of one Lady Brooks and um, Willis recommends that an incision in the skull is made and um, he recommends to keep it open for some time as well, um, apparently filling it with some lint, which is sort of a, a cluster of textiles or uh, uh, 
gentian root, which is um, probably some mixture of a, a, a plant root. And he also prescribes a diet of light meals of the flesh and spoon meat, spoon meat, not necessarily being meat, but um, sort of anything you can eat with a spoon like soup. And um, he goes on also recommending um, to keep a blister under the lady's ear open. And uh, finally, he provides a, a recipe um, to for sort of some kind of paste to put on the ladies um, feet sort of as a postscript. Um, actually, most of the recipes he, he has for his prescriptions, they're sort of given as a postscript to the letters. I hope the lady survived over that. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, it has to be said that um, although his uh, recipes and his uh, or, or prescriptions and his treatments uh, might be a cut above um, the sort of what you would get on a, a, from a marketplace barber at the time. Um, uh, uh, reading them nowadays, uh, you'd still think, what, what were they thinking? But um, for the 17th century, they, they were the, um, probably um, some of the best uh, that a patient could get. At least Willis was looking for the uh, for the rational explanation of diseases, yes. and he, he was searching for explanation. Yes, uh, yes, but the yes, treatments, yes. unfortunately, they were just not, uh, yeah. not up to, to yeah. uh, current standards. But it comes out in his printed books that he tries to combine um, his um, research with his uh, uh, practice because he provides cases uh, which um, he, he uses uh, also as uh, arguments and support in his publications for his research. I think he, he managed to combine his uh, clinical practice, his research, teaching, and he published, he was very prolific in, in, in publishing. He was quite wealthy, that also helped, and famous. And I think this was a deadly combination, and that's why he is with us even today even after 400 years after his birth, um, um, he still have a message for us uh, for today, for clinical work, for research, publishing. I think the Chinese or the Indians might have cottoned it, but Willis in Latin described uh, that there was renal disease, and in some renal disease, the urine was was sweet. Mm -hmm. That was diabetes mellitus. Oh. And then malaria. The first description of malaria, certainly yeah. in England, is Thomas Willis. Mm. Because he said, if you have lots of fever, yes. and you treat it with chinchona bark, yeah. Jewett's, Jesuit's bark, yeah. uh, if the fever is episodic, it cures it. If it's not episodic, it doesn't. Oh. Well, that's the first evidence that yeah. there was malaria in Europe. Yes, yes, I heard that it was much more common in and Europe then typhus, than in the past. The first, epidemic of type, the first oh. epidemic ever described thoroughly is by Thomas Willis of typhus. And so it goes on, and the ENT surgeons, they have two or three things. But achalasia of the cardia, he not only diagnosed it, he knew how to treat it, created something to dilate the, uh, the esophagus. Yeah. <laughs> and myasthenia gravis, that I've just given you, a strange illness that, uh, that uh, you're, if, you're, if you work, if you use your muscles and then they tire, and you wait a little while and your muscles come back, this is myasthenia gravis. Well, he made such a perfect description of it that I used to use it to teach my students. Ah. And, and the treatments he came up with, are they still current? Or he, is, he wasn't nearly new? so advanced in treatment. Mm -hmm. No one was. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had, he, uh, he had a whole book on treatment, mm -hmm. pharmaceutical rationales, but they were, <laughs> they were not much of it was of much use, I don't think. Yeah. I've never defended Willis' his pharma pharmacy. Yeah. But anatomy, he was the greatest anatomist yeah. of the whole world. Yeah. 
And the difference between his anatomy with others was that in, in Germany, France, Italy, a person would have, the anatomist would have one body a year to dissect. Mm. Willis used to dissect, his patients who died. Oh. So he made many, yeah. many yeah. dissections. And uh, this is what, how the brain pathologist described, the brain anatomy described, on his own patients. Yeah. And then he wrote an account of the case and then on his findings. So the clinical pathological mm -hmm. correlation was mm -hmm. wonderful. So what other interesting books uh, do we have at St. John's? So we here we have um, arguably Williams's uh, most famous work, the Cerebri Anatomy, and you can see the title page here. And uh, this is, of course, as you all know much better than me, the first time the word neurology is uh, being used. Although actually, because Willis is um, writing in Latin, he doesn't use the English form of it, of course. So if we go to chapter 19, so he creates the, um, the Greek word neurologia, which he takes from two um, compound words. The first being neuron, which is the Greek word for sinew or tenon, and the logia, which is derived from logos for word or um, the verb stem log, uh, to, which is to say, and which is in the form of logia usually used to um, describe a, a science or a, a different um, subject which one studies. So we know it from, um, not just from neurology or neurologia, but also from geology. And uh, there are lots of ologies um, in, in universities nowadays. And um, this Greek word is uh, translated into the English neurology in the uh, first English translation of the Cherubri anatomy. So that was the first ever use of the term neurologia, or neurology. For a very long time, neurology um, has been used to describe, um, well, very likely referring back to Willis um, as the, the doctrine or the system of the, um, the nervous system. Um, um, certainly throughout the um, 18th century. Um, looking at the Oxford English Dictionary, um, the, the, the meaning we use nowadays for neurology, which is the, the, the medical discipline, uh, that has first appeared in 1875. At least that's the first quote that the um, dictionary, uh, Oxford English Dictionary gives and there usually pretty good in finding the first reference to a meaning. Of course, this book is not only famous um, um, for the use of neurologia, but also for its um, illustrations. And I'll go back um, a little bit um, to this one, which is, um, one of the first illustrations and possibly also um, the most famous. Thomas Willis was friends with Christopher Wren, which nowadays, of course, is most uh, famous as an architect and the uh, um, architect of St. Paul's in London. Uh, but he had uh, various other interests as well. And um, yes, amongst other things, he also made the, well, most of the uh, illustrations for this um, publication of Willis. So here um, on this image, you can see the two vertebral arteries uh, coming in through the foramen magnum. They unite into a basilar artery 
And then in addition to this, you have the two internal carotid arteries um, arriving through the carotid canal, and then they unite into a circle, and then they provide three pairs of arteries, the anterior, middle, and the posterior cerebral arteries uh, from this circle. And apparently, Willis was not the first who described this, many others described this uh, before, but because of the fantastic illustrations of Wren uh, and the publications, and probably uh, Richard Lauer started calling it Willis Circle uh, himself, uh, this name was sticking in the international literature. So that's why we probably call it uh, the Willis Circle. And he was also responsible for, um, for providing uh, perhaps the best um, functional uh, suggestions, what, what this circle was for, why was it useful for the collateral circulation of the brain. And he, he also described one case when the, the patient died of a tumor uh, and had some occlusions in, in uh, parts of this circle, but nevertheless, no symptoms. So he suggested that uh, um, there was uh, some, they had some kind of a compensatory mechanisms uh, to still provide the circulation for the brain. And that could explain why there was no um, damage um, to all these uh, neurological functions in that patient. So, so I think that's why we, we are sticking with the name um, uh, for, for the circle of Willis. This is a, a normal human uh, brain. And I think from the shape, you can tell that that brain was uh, falling apart. Um, uh, they, they didn't use much fixative in those days. These are the cranial nerves of a sheep brain, I think in that page. And that's the brain stem. You can see the superior inferior colliculi uh, cerebellum. Right. Um, oh, and that is where a very nice picture where you are right now. I think that figure uh, with the uh, autonomic nervous system, this is uh, an incredible um, summary. You can see the various cranial nerves. Um, you see the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic ganglia. You see the... Um, superior cervical ganglion, uh, the plexus cordis, all these structures innovating the heart. And in fact, they did some experiments where they ligated um, the vagus nerve and they looked at the effect on the heartbeat. So these are revolutionary experiments. And, and this drawing is slightly different from the drawing uh, we could see before, which were probably Christopher Wren's drawings. And this is uh, apparently Richard Lauer's drawing of the autonomous autonomous nervous system. So this is, we could even use this um, drawing today to teach neuroanatomy. They even have some invertebrate uh, organisms, which is incredible that he included all these organisms and their nervous system. No, oh, this is one of my favorite. It's an incredible drawing, no, of a, of a lobster. So that's also, a, it's kind of like a worm. And Willis was looking at the nervous system of these creatures. And in the Anima Brutorum, um, he has these uh, comparative ideas articulated. And he argues that the human cerebral cortex is the biggest. It, it has the, um, the largest, uh, we human have the largest cerebral cortex, the most convoluted cerebral cortex, uh, from the species he studied. And that's why he, he argues that um, this is what makes us human. Uh, the, the tissue of the cerebral cortex, which is the most elaborate in human. And I think in 16, uh, sorry, the 17th century, this was a huge uh, um, suggestion based on his comparative work. And also he dissected some of his patients who died and then he looked at the morphology of their brain and uh, he uh, noticed that some of the patients with uh, symptoms of epilepsy or intractable epilepsy or um, uh, learning difficulties, they had altered shape. So that their cerebral cortex had a different shape. And based on the comparative work and also this uh, 
uh, clinical pathological examinations of, of his patient's brain, he suggested that it has to be the cerebral cortex, which is seat of the higher cognitive function. And, and for me, that's why Willis is just an outstanding um, uh, clinician scholar. And, uh, and I think we will be looking at his books for centuries to come. So Willis always acknowledged the help of others and I'm just wondering whether we could find some evidence from, from his book. So if we have a look at the preface uh, of some of his books, maybe like Cerebri Anatomy, can we find some evidence that he acknowledged his, his team? It looks like Thomas Willis had the same collaborative and open and frank approach to his um, publications um, as he did to his medical practice. Um, you can see in the preface of Cerebri Anatomy, for instance, um, that he is thanking uh, Dr. Wren, Dr. Riccardi Loa um, here, and on the other side, um, one Thomas Millington, Christopher Wren, um, and also Professor... So he acknowledged it, that this was a team effort and um, that's why he was so productive. What, uh, Petra, what is your favorite uh, Willis publication? St. John seemed to have kept these books in different parts of their collections. Um, you can see with uh, De Anima Brutorum, for instance, you can see that the binding ha actually has... Um, two holes here. Did they chain these books? Which also um, are replicated um, inside. Um, here we go. Yes, they did chain them, not all of them, part of them they chained. And usually in the um, early modern, also um, later medieval times, li college libraries had two collections. They had a chain collection, which um, in St. John's case would have been in the uh, beautiful old library, which um, is currently prepared for uh, refurbishment or some renovations, I should say. And um, they had a, and in that library, the books were chained. That was their sort of security. Security is an yeah. arrangement, yeah. So the uh, readers couldn't run away with the books and the books never to be seen again. <laughs> Do you know the origin of these books? How did they end up at St. John's? Yes, for some books, we don't know the origin. For most of them, we do the, uh, know the origin. Uh, actually, the two-volume publication, Pharmaceutice Rationalis, were presented to the college by one Brown Willis. Brown Willis turns out to be the grandson of our Thomas Willis. And... Um, Brown Willis was an antiquary. Um, his specialty was numismatics, so nothing to do with medicine. He was also a politician. He was set in the House of Commons from 1705 to 1708. And a really nice story. Um, he, he had a church built in the memory of his grandfather, Thomas Willis. And the church still exists today. It's in uh, St. Martin's Church in Fenny Stratford, which became part of um, Milton Keynes when Milton Keynes was built from scratch in the 1960s. And uh, it was built in the memorial, or rather it was called St. Martin's Church because um, when Willis moved to London from Oxford, he lived in uh, St. Martin's Lane in the London parish of St. Martin's in the field. And Thomas Willis died on St. Martin's Day on the um, 11th of November, 1675. And not only did uh, Brown Willis have this church built um, between 17. 24 and 1730, he also arranged for a sermon to be read every year and uh, in the memory of his grandfather. And on the occasion, the um, local clergy and gentry was invited for dinner. And a, um, 
six small cannons, the fanny poppers, were fired on uh, this occasion. And actually, um, this is still being done to this day. Three times um, the, uh, are the fanny poppers fired today. Uh, it has nothing to do with the Remembrance Day, which um, historically is uh, um, came about much later. At um, the um, at Fanny Stratford, when they fire those cannons on the 11th of November, it is solely in memory of Thomas Willis and all down to his grandson. Thank you so much for looking after this incredible heritage uh, we have. And um, it was real fun talking to you about uh, the history of medicine, history of St. John's and the history of Willis. Thank you. It's, um, as I always say, there are no uninteresting old books. And once you get your head into it and you start discovering books, it's just uh, fascinating to see what the, they're still left over from the past.